We are uh, in a, a series that we started at the beginning of this month that we have called Honey in the Rock. All right, now for those of you guys who have missed it, um, this is a topic that derived from a very bizarre experience that has marked this ministry from its genesis until now, uh, 1997, when uh, Pastor Francis was touring the Bonita building. Um, there was a room that was infested by uh, and inhabited by bees uh, that they couldn't enter into. And about a decade later, or excuse me, about a decade ago, um, there was another instance of this where bees got into the walls of our Bonita building and created a beehive. And then this past summer, again, Josh and I, we were working uh, in the Bonita building and he told me, hey, there's a room here that we can't, like behind this wall could be a beehive. And I started freaking out, like, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, there could be bees. And as it turns out, there were 30,000 bees in an eight frame honey producing hive in our walls. Um, and so as disturbing as it is, um, that, that keeps happening as much as we are committed to stopping that from happening in the future. Okay, it's a lot of damage that happens. Um, we believe this is a prophetic sign from God, yeah. right? That what he intended to do, what he intended to do when this ministry was established and what he reminded us of a decade ago, he still intends to do here. Amen. He intends to do here. And so this idea of honey from a rock comes from Psalm 81, um, where God is pouring out his heart as he describes what he desires to do for his people. All right, and so here's where we find it in scripture. So Psalm 81, starting 13, uh, verse 13 says, Oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would follow me walking in my paths. How quickly I would then subdue their enemies. How soon my hands would be upon their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him. They would be doomed forever. But I would feed you with the finest wheat. I would satisfy you with wild honey from the rock. Now, the last few weeks, we've talked about the context of this psalm, um, that it was written to be sung at the Feast of Tabernacle. It references uh, the children of Israel at Meribah as God took them out of Egypt. It is a psalm about the wilderness seasons of life. So the honey from a rock denotes God's miraculous provision even in the dry desert seasons for the people of God. And so what I want to do today is I want to look at another psalm with you. Now, I know preachers say this all the time, but the psalm I'm going to go over with you today is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Okay. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I would say to you that no passage has helped me endure pain. Uh, no passage has helped me uh, in times of suffering and hard seasons of life than Psalm 84. Uh, and, and, I, and I believe the reason why is because it does three things. Psalm 84, I believe, gives us the predicament of pain, the prize of pain, and it shows us the product of pain. Okay, the predicament of pain, the prize of pain, the product of pain. So you guys willing to go with me on this? Yeah. If I can break this down for you. And so uh, first, the predicament of pain. So at the beginning of this psalm, the psalmist almost seems homesick as he talks about being in the presence of God at the temple in Zion. Um, when I moved here from the Bay Area, I was seven years old. And um, I moved to the city of Antelope, which is close by here. Yeah, Antelope, there you go. Okay. You know it. I have a fellow antelopian here. So I uh, moved to Antelope, and it was very undeveloped at that time. There was not a whole lot you know, that was built yet. And um, when I moved here, we moved with about 13 of us. It was my grandma, a few aunts, an uncle, uh, and a boatload of cousins. We just all came, and we uh, piled into a five-bedroom house, brand-new house in Antelope, and I actually sometimes get a little homesick. Like I think about that time in my life often. I was about seven years old to about 12 years old. I lived in that house. And there were so many amazing things that happened there when I was a child. So much so that when we drive like past that area, I will sometimes detour into that neighborhood. My family gets annoyed with this. But I just take them into the neighborhood and I'm just like, 
telling them, oh man, this is where we played baseball and this is where we had our, our fort and our friend had a pool there. And like, I would just, I'll just tell them everything. They're like, dad, drive, drive, come on, come on. But I just get nostalgic just thinking about this. And I feel like the psalmist has the same vibe here is that he's just homesick because he says things like, uh, he says, my heart and my flesh cry out for you. How lovely is your dwelling place. I long to enter your courts is the language he uses. But then we get to verse five where it says, blessed are those whose strength is in you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Now, operating in our own strength, and I don't think this is an overstatement, but operating in our own strength is the weakest thing we can do as believers. It is actually the thing that spawns all the things that we do that don't please God. Amen. But finding our strength in God, uh, on the contrary, is the most important factor when it comes to suffering well and overcoming painful adversity. Biblical Christianity gives us an abundance of resources to deal with pain, yet we find ourselves in the predicament of living in an individualistic culture that exalts the self. And therefore, many of us actually can't find a whole lot of good in pain and suffering, anything positive in suffering. Uh, the late Tim Keller in his book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, he talks about this when he says that sociologists and anthropologists have analyzed and compared the various ways that cultures train its members for grief, pain, and loss. And when this comparison is done, it is often noted that our contemporary secular Western culture is one of the weakest and worst in history in doing so. Our own contemporary Western society gives its members no explanation for suffering and very little guidance as to how to deal with it. He then goes on and he quotes a, a, a man uh, named Paul Brand. Paul Brand was an orthopedic surgeon who specialized in the treatment of uh, patients with leprosy. And he spent half of his career in India and the other half of his career in America. And this is what Paul Brand said in his observation. He said, in the United States, I encountered a society that seeks to avoid pain at all costs. Patients lived at a greater comfort level than any I'd ever previously treated, but they seemed far less equipped to handle suffering and far more traumatized by it. We live in a Western secular culture that sees no value in suffering. And so when it comes into our lives, many of us don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to deal with it. So what do we do? We avoid it, we deny it, and we despair in it. But the psalmist says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. And so what he's saying here is, I'm not where I long to be. I'm not even where I want to be. But his response is not to despair where he is. He decides to make movement towards God. And I've shared this before. Um, I was um, a six-year-old in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake that hit the Bay Area. Um, I was six years old. I was living in the Bay Area at the time. This is an earthquake that uh, I believe over 60 people died in the earthquake. About $6 billion of damage happened. Um, and I was suffering from... Um, from appendicitis, and I was in my aunt and uncle's apartment when it happened. And the apartment starts shaking violently, and everyone bolts out of the apartment. I think they think that I can get out by myself, but I was in too much pain. And so I'm sitting in the apartment, and I think to myself, you know what, I'm just going to wait until this ends. Not knowing that the, the apartment was like in danger of collapsing, like I'm literally, I remember this vividly because my dresser and my TV are jumping up and down in my room. And I'm just like, ah, oh, this will go away. <laughs> you know, and I think a lot of us do this, right? This is the predicament of pain, uh, uh, that pain puts us in. That when we experience pain, I think the default mode of the unaided human heart is to go the way of the ostrich and just put our head in the sand. Yeah. We ball up in fetal position, we try to wait it out, but we can learn something from the psalmist here who said, blessed are the ones who are operating on a strength not their own and have thereby set their heart 
on pilgrimage. The psalmist turns his pain into pilgrimage. He remains on the journey. He remains committed to the journey and he's able to put his current circumstances into healing perspective. I love how the ESV translates verse five. It says, blessed are those whose strength is in you in whose heart are the highways to Zion, right? So highways are built in cities because you have a lot of people that are trying to get from one place to another, but they're provided as a way to give people the quickest path to where they want to go, yeah? And so to make your heart a highway to the presence of God means that you understand pain to be the quickest route to God. There are things that you and I learn in pain that we just don't learn in comfort, right? We just don't learn these things in comfort. Pain strips us of self-sufficiency and reminds us of our humanity. Making our hearts a highway in the midst of pain also means that you remind yourself that many people have traveled this path before. See, pain will lie to you. Pain will, pain will tell you that you are the only one experiencing this. Have you been there? I'm the only one going through this. Everyone has it easier. Everyone else has it better. No one is dealing with this. I'm the only one suffering, and yet the truth is that many people have traveled this road before. Many people. The message translation says it this way. It says, how blessed are those in whom you live whose lives become roads you travel. Man, that's good. All right, so not only is the psalmist making pain his pilgrimage, And not only is he accepting it as the quickest route to the presence of God and telling himself that he's not alone, but this highway to God is the same highway God uses to draw near to us. It's the same highway. There's something about a believer suffering well and enduring pain that makes this idea of Jesus compelling and desirable. We spent this summer preaching through the book of Judges and God bless you guys who survived it. Um, but there's a book right after the book of Judges, a uh, really short book that actually took place historically during the Judges era about a woman named Ruth. And Ruth is this really impressive biblical figure who, um, against a lot of odds, became one of the mothers in the lineage of Jesus. Uh, but it would have never happened without her mother-in-law, Naomi. Naomi, you see this in Ruth chapter one, Naomi... Um, and her husband and her two sons, they are displaced, right? There's a famine in the land, and so they have to leave their land and go to another land. But shortly after that, Naomi's husband dies. And not too long after that then, her two sons die. And so within a snap of a finger, she goes from having this amazing life that she built to basically taking on one of the worst statuses in that culture. She becomes an old woman, that's a widow with no children. She is relegated at this point to, to basically be a beggar for the rest of her life. And there's something about watching that as Ruth, that Ruth says, the famous statement that we all know that Ruth says, Ruth watches her go through all this. And on the other side of it, Ruth says to her, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. There was something about watching her mother-in-law go through this that was compelling, that made God desirable. And so pain is an invitation from God to make your life a road he travels. God will draw near to you when you're in pain, but not only will he draw near to you, he will also draw others to himself as well. It's a beautiful thing. And so pain puts us in a predicament, right? So the question is, do you avoid it? Do you deny it? Do you despair in it? Or do you make it work for you? What do you do? Secondly, the prize of pain. The prize of pain. Psalm 84, five and six. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The Valley of Baca was a place without water. It was 
an actual place near Jerusalem. And so as the psalmist visualizes what it would be like to experience nearness to God, he remembers the dry desert terrain that will inevitably be something he has to pass through to get there. But the key phrase to me in this passage here is, as they pass through. As they pass through. Pain passes. It passes. Precariously in this life or unshakably in the next. Pain passes. The Valley of Baca literally means the place of weeping. Psalm 30 says it this way, weeping will endure for the night, but what? Joy comes in the morning. And so not only does pain pass, but it says as they pass through the valley of Baca, I love this, they make it a place of springs. As they pass through the valley of weeping, they make it a place of springs. And so the prize of pain, guys, uh, the, the, the honey in the rock, so to speak, is right here. And it's this, that God is so God that he is even taking the bad things that happen to you and he's causing it to produce a greater good. That is how God, God is. That it is in the dry seasons of our lives that we may become springs for others. Now let's camp here for a second. Let's camp here. Can your children say this about you? Can your children say, man, mom, I know it's monotonous around here. I know it's tough around here. Laundry and more laundry, cooking and more cooking, cleaning and more cleaning, over and over again. Very little thanks, very little acknowledgement, but mom, you make this a place of springs. Now, I know it's true that it's rare that our kids put their arms around us and tell us good job. You know, I have such an appreciation for my mom and my aunts now that I'm an adult. And so you're not going to get the thanks now. Trust me. Just, I mean, if you do, God bless you. Maybe teach me your ways. But, but one day your kids, your faithfulness, they'll say, you made it a place of springs. How about your coworkers at work? Can they say this about you? Man, I know this is a, a hard place to work. It's grueling work. It's tough. But man, you can always come in here and you have a good attitude. You never commiserate with us about the bosses. You never talk crap about the bosses at the water cooler with us. Man, you make this a place of springs. Even David shows us this in Psalm 23 when he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me which is to say that when you walk with God, even your dark places have light, right? How do I see that here? He says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. How can you have a shadow if there's not light somewhere? I got a ooh out of that. There we go. I got a ooh out of that. Even your dark places as a believer have light, amen? And so the prize of pain is not only that it passes, but it is the catalyst that enables us to become springs for the relief and refreshment for others, right? So the predicament of pain, the prize of pain, and lastly, the product of pain. So the Psalm ends with this remarkable language about what happens on the other side of making pain our pilgrimage and passing through the valley of Baca, the valley of weeping. See, pain can make you a profoundly deep and whole and beautiful person if you handle it correctly. Psalm 126 says, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves, with them. And so the implication in this passage is it's telling us that there is a, actually a way to waste your sorrows. That you can go through pain and suffering and get nothing out of it. Right? This psalm is telling us that your tears, according to this psalm, 
are like Look at the word picture here. Imagine a farmer who goes out to a field with a bag of seed. Scattering the seed, he just dumps the seed on the ground right in front of him. Okay, if he does that, he will not get the harvest that he can get, right? You may get something that grows up here, but you're not going to get what you should get. And it is possible to grieve in such a way that it doesn't produce any fruit in your life at all. It is possible to just dump. It is possible to weep, to cry, to yell, to go through hell. But instead of going through it, you camp there and you stay and you make your home in that place. But Psalm 126 tells us, and the end of Psalm 84 confirms that joy is actually produced by sorrow. You want to be a joyful person. Stop running from your pain. So how do we know that we're not wasting our sorrows, but instead we're becoming people of joy, Christ-like character? I think the end of Psalm 84 gives us a checklist. So I want to go over this with you real quick, and then we're done. Starting in verse 9. Verse 9 says, Look on your shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Look on your shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. So the psalmist lifts his eyes above all the hard stuff. He lifts his eyes up above his own suffering, above his own circumstances, and he begins to pray. See, prayer seems almost impossible to many of us when we're in pain, doesn't it? It seems really hard to do. But if you pray when you're in pain, it'll enable you to bring your pain before God and it will prevent your pain from becoming your God. If you can bring it to him. But the psalmist actually takes it a step further because the psalmist doesn't just pray. The psalmist begins to pray for someone else. Right? It says, uh, it says, look with favor on your anointed one. You know what he's praying for? He's praying for the king. He's praying for his government officials and political leaders. Right? And so when you can pray for others and serve others, even while you suffer, that's how you'll know that you are becoming a beautiful product of pain. Verse 10 says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. See, pain has the ability to forge um, a, a, in us a new sense of what really matters doesn't it? it? It it puts something new in us. It it realigns our values. The psalmist suffered in the midst of it. He found God faithful in doing so. It completely realigned things for him. The psalmist began to see uh, service as more important than status. Integrity over comfort. Wisdom over wealth. Character over capital is what he began to see. One day spent in your house, the message translation says. This beautiful place of worship beats thousands spent on Greek island beaches. I'd rather scrub floors in the house of my God than be honored as a guest in the palace of sin. <laughs> so good, so good. Patty, I know this is, this is me and Patty's favorite psalm right here. So she's feeling it, she's feeling it. So the question is, is there a cost? Is there a cost to following Christ? Oh, hey. You know, may it cut into your standard of living. Getting excited up here. What? No more beaches. All right. Does it mean that we may miss out on the good things of life? Can it mean that we end up as a doorkeeper rather than a property owner? Yes, but does that matter? No, it doesn't. Oh, but Sean, I thought God wanted to prosper me. Yeah, he does. Maybe not the way you think, though. Maybe not the way you think. See, because for some of us, it would be a major trial. It would be the ultimate wilderness and desert experience for you to actually be a doorkeeper in the house of God. It would be a traumatic experience for you. Why? Because although the psalm goes on in verse 11 
to call God our sun and shield, maybe, just maybe, in your world, you're the sun. Everything revolves around you. So the question is, are your values realigned? When you can care less about personal gain and advancement and more about God's glory and his kingdom advancement, you are becoming a beautiful product of pain. The last part of the checklist here, verse 11 and 12. Uh, For years, I had this verse taped onto my computer because I, uh, uh, like right after I got married, I got a job, actually right before I got married, I got a job uh, working for the, the Roseville Telephone Company that became Sure West, that became Consolidated. <laughs> Some of you guys know what I mean. And uh, within two years, I went from it being a part-time job to it being a full-time job to being third key of a store, to being the assistant manager of a store, to being the manager of my own store. All right, within two years. I was in my early 20s and I thought I was in the pinnacle of my working life. Man, I didn't know anything. But I thought I was running things. Like, I thought I had it. It was an amazing job. The pay was great, but the position was better. I literally thought I was doing what I was made to do. And then shortly after I got that position, we sold off that part of the company and I lost my job. Now, thankfully, I was one of a few people that they retained, but when they retained me, they asked me to work inside in the customer care center, all right? So I had to take this menial task. My job was literally, I had to talk folks out of disconnecting their service. That's what I did. It was rough. I mean, it turned out to be a good job eventually, but it was really hard. It was hard. And... I just remember struggling. Um, I was so bummed out about losing my position that my performance dipped. I I literally just would not show up. I would show up, but I wasn't there. You know what that's like, right? We all know people who quit, but don't quit. And so I would show up to work and I would sit in my desk and I'd just be bummed out. I'd be upset. It was such a setback for me. I wasn't hitting goal. I was at the bottom of uh, production. I got to a point where I couldn't financially make it just working that job. And I began to realistically entertain the idea of taking a morning paper route just to make up the difference. And so now I'm mad. I'm really upset and I sit down one day to just talk to God about it, to complain to God. You've done that, right? And as I pour out my grievances in prayer, I then open up my devotion and I get hit, I get smacked in the face with two passages of scripture. Can I share it with you? First passage, Proverbs 13, four. The sluggard craves and gets nothing. But the, de- but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. The other passage of scripture was Psalm 84, 11 and 12. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. And then God spoke to me. I heard the inward audible voice of God. Sean, how do you know it was the inward audible voice of God? Because it sobered me in the moment. And he said something that I would not have said to myself in that state. And it was a very simple thing. You know what he said? He said, everything you want is available to you if you would just work harder. I was stunned, stunned. It was the first moment that I took my eyes off of myself. The very next day I went into the office, I went 
into my boss's office and I said, hey, listen, I've been really discouraged about this position. It's been hard on me to, to do this and I've not been giving full effort. But I want you to know that when I get up from this chair and I walk out of this door, I'm gonna be the best rep on your team. Hold on, hold on. You don't know what happened. The very same time the company launches this President's Club initiative where if you can hit stretch goals, they'll send you all over the world on vacation. And I'm in the States, like taking Amy on vacation is the last thing I can think about in life, right? But almost exactly a year later from that moment that I walked in my boss's office, I was on a beach in Jamaica. And I, and I vividly, I remember this. I'm sitting on the beach with Amy in Jamaica and God speaks to me again. You know what he says? The desires of a diligent are fully satisfied. No good thing will I withhold from those who walk uprightly. Now, let me say this, you know, they, they teach us never make yourself the hero. Um, I'm not the hero of that story. That was God showing up in the midst of my pain to tell me exactly how it is. It was God riding the highway and coming right where I needed him to tell me what's going on. And so the point I wanna make by telling you that story is that when you become resolute in your desire to trust and obey God, no matter where you are, no matter what you're experiencing, you are becoming a beautiful product of pain. Amen. Let's stand together. Now, I don't presume that I can preach a sermon good enough to make anyone in here feel good about pain and suffering. <laughs> okay. All right. It's, it's easy to talk about, very hard to live. Yeah. All right. It's hard to live this out. Every one of us are going to have to pass through a valley of Baca, a valley of weeping in our lives. You know, I heard it once said this way, that every culture must help people face and understand suffering or risk loss of its credibility. And this is where I believe Jesus comes in. Because Jesus is the ultimate pain bearer. Nowhere do we see a better picture of pain being transformed and transfigured than by his work on the cross. And the reason why is because it was there that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It was when Jesus felt utterly abandoned. It's when he felt cut off, when he felt the most pain, when he felt isolated and helpless on the cross that he was more completely and richly transformative and more of a spring for all humanity. I mean, you gotta understand this. Through pain, like Jesus put himself in that predicament to make you his prize. Who do you know that better prayed for others even while they suffered? On the cross, Jesus is hanging there dying for you and me. What does he pray? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Who do you know that better shrugged off personal gain and advancement in order to advance the kingdom of God and to give God the most glory? Who do you know? In the Garden of Gethsemane, before Jesus was betrayed and tortured and hung on a cross, as he prayed to his father, he said, hey, if there's another way, can we work this out right now? But I don't want my will. I want yours. Who do you know that better demonstrated resolute trust and obedience to God? Huh? Jesus and his walk was perfectly blameless. His literal dying words were, into your hands, I commit my spirit. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. 
Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Well, let me tell you this. Jesus was perfectly blameless. Jesus trusted his father fully. And he didn't get the good thing and he didn't get the blessing so that you and I could. And so if you're here today and you would say, Sean, I know what the Valley of Baca is. I know what it means to live in the place of weeping, in the valley of weeping. The life has been hard. I wanna to appeal to you today. If that's the season you're in now, or if that's the season you're coming out of, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. So the question is, are you operating out of your own strength? The Psalm says that we will go from strength to strength. It is by grace through faith that we are saved. God is the beginning and the end of this. If you're walking in your own strength, it's the beginning of the problem. Are you avoiding, denying, and despairing in your pain and suffering? I would advise you today, to make pain your pilgrimage, amen? Don't waste your sorrows. Pray, pray for others. Realign your values, trust and obey, amen. With all heads bow, all eyes closed. You're here today. You would say, Sean, I need honey from the rock. I need God's miraculous provision even now where I am. I need that. Just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. Amen. Amen. I see you guys. I see you guys. Amen. Okay. You're here today and you would say, Sean, this all resonates with me. I hear you talking about Jesus, but I don't know him as my Lord and Savior, but I need to. And if you want that today, I want to pray for you as well. Just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. I see you, brother. I see you. Lord Jesus, I just pray for this beautiful faith community. God, we cannot avoid pain. We cannot avoid the hard times. We cannot avoid the valley of weeping. But I thank you that you are so God that somehow you have the ability to take even the bad things that happen to us and produce greater good out of it. And it looks different in all of our lives, comes at different times and in different ways. But God, we thank you that we are sure that in Jesus, all of this is so. Thank you, God, for your willingness to give us honey from the rock, that in the midst of being in the desert and dry place, God, you will show up and give miraculous provision. God, we thank you for the pilgrimage that we get to go on. God, we thank you in Jesus' name.